So I fall so hard, the employees wanna find me And then wanna hire me What's 100k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Fall so hard, this ain't easy Working late nights, you best believe me My grades can only go ace Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay-Z so What's good? Thanks your host, Jim Carrey, a.k.a. Form D and the ED And I'm bringing you another episode of the Form So Hard Podcast Today we have another special episode And I got people here much smarter than me uh, it's going to be a phenomenal episode, and we're going to talk about something that a lot of us get to see. Uh, this episode is called You're Breaking My Heart. We're going to talk about the management of acute coronary syndrome, particularly in the ED. And I have some people with me that's going to really rock your world. Uh, I have Dr. Quinn Cummings with me. Again, you guys heard him on a few episodes we've done before. He's going to be back. We're going to have him a lot more this year. And I have what we call a super resident here. We have Al Jones. He's one of our PGY1 residents, but he's like super interested in ED. And he's probably going to replace me or you guys view me in the next five years. So glad to have you guys on. Anything you guys want to just introduce yourself to where you're from, one thing that you enjoy? Uh, yeah, my, I'm Quinn. I'm one of the uh, emergency medicine attendings um, and pediatric emergency medicine attendings here uh, at MUSC uh, and also at the Sean Jenkins Children's Hospital. Um, my uh, biggest passion right now is point of care ultrasound. But uh, what actually drew me to uh, medicine was uh, seeing my first uh, ECG. I yeah. went to a um, sort of a medical summer camp. Uh, it was like a two week program when I was in fifth grade. And I remember seeing uh, an electrocardiogram for the first time. Uh, and I thought it was uh, magic. It actually inspired me to create my first email, which was cardio89 at doctor.com. So <laughs> I've been an unabashed uh, nerd for uh, quite some time now. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Al, tell us a little bit more about you. Very cool. Thanks for having me today, Jimmy. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, like Jimmy said, I'm a PGY1 pharmacy resident here at MUSC. Um, I'm actually originally from uh, Montana. Uh, I like to say I was I was raised in the mountains. Um, I did my pharmacy school at Oregon Health and Sciences University and Oregon State University over on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> I was actually first uh, exposed to uh, pharmacy in the in the emergency department um, while I was a research assistant at OHSU. And uh, we had a, a trauma come in. A uh, patient was uh, uh, very unamenable to uh, the initial exam, uh, very anxious. And the attending, uh, I know he was the attending position, uh, kept yelling for, for Nate. Where's Nate at? We need Nate. Uh, turns out Nate was the pharmacist. Uh, Nate came in. He had the exact uh, plan and the medicine for the for the situation. Uh, the, the, you know, the medication was administered. Uh, the patient uh, calmed down. Uh, team was able to kind of uh, do their initial exam, uh, provide treatment. And uh, Nate, you know, walked out of the room with everybody, kind of give them a thumbs up. Uh, after that, I said, I think I'm going to pursue pharmacy. <laughs> so, nice um, job, Nate. Your yeah. legend persists. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, and then came down here to MUSC, uh, kind of uh, have had the opportunity to uh, work really close with Jimmy in the ED. And uh, I know that this is kind of what I want to do with my with, with my career. So just happy to be here. Perfect. We're also joined today uh, by one of our uh, second year emergency medicine residents. Um, Dr. Thompson, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, guys. I'm Megan Thompson. I'm one of the second year residents here at MUSC. Um, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We're going to go into a lot of the diagnostic workup, right? Um, these when, it, when these patients come in, we got to figure out what's going on. A lot of pharmacists are, again, we're focused on figuring out what does our provider think's going on because once we get that information in the second segment of this we can talk about a lot of the treatment so as we look at this uh talk about again the diagnostic work of a patient once they first come to you and you're suspecting them and we can just make it simple here we can say STEMI we can just say you know ST elevated myocardial infarction and focus on that for this episode but what's your diagnostic work of these patients when they first come in um, so first thing, chest pain is like the classic thing that we think about, but it has to be a certain type of chest pain for me to really be concerned, like crushing, pressure like chest pain. Um, we talk about radiating to the arm, right or left arm, radiating up into the neck. Um, those are like the classic, you hear that, then you want an EKG stat, you want a troponin, um, you want to do a bedside echo. Mm -hmm. um, also just looking at what past medical history does this patient have, hypertension, diabetes, poorly controlled diabetes, are they a vasculopath? with horrible peripheral vascular disease, then they're just high risk for having junk in their coronaries in general. So. Right. And I think, you know, one of the important parts of that is with your history, um, your past medical history is that that um, that's like population level data too. Right. So mm -hmm. if you have someone who has a, who has a really good story for it with no risk factors, mm -hmm. I don't feel reassured. 
Mm -hmm. for that they don't have hypertension, you know, if they're diaphoretic. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and complaining of crushing chest pain, you know, I don't, I don't think, well, your 10 year Framingham uh, risk score, you know, um, those are obviously important in in helping you construct the differential diagnosis. um, But it should not um, encourage you to discard the diagnosis, uh, I think, you know, is one of our main things. Um, So you mentioned uh, radiation to the left or right arm. So it sounds like any radiation. Yeah. Is, is any bad, radiation is bad. Know? Yeah, totally. It's kind of interesting, but um, apparently if it radiates to the right arm, it's actually more specific, more specific. Yeah, yeah, that's what which is ca- yeah. kind of crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And that actually makes sense um, after I've been practicing for a little bit and seeing many patients complaining of chest pain radiating to their left arm that I've followed up with months later that ended up having nothing, nothing, you know, yeah. um, so uh, I don't really know the pathophysiology behind that. I'm sure there's some, you know, nerve cross wire, um, like referred pain uh, mm-hmm. that we're seeing, but mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting that, so any radiation is bad. Um, totally. Diaphoresis, totally. you mentioned the characteristics of, of crushing, sort of pressure-like. Totally. One other diagnostic tool that we can use is nitro. I know we'll talk about it later in the podcast, but if they're having this chest pain, you've kind of ruled out an inferior MI and all those other things. You can try nitro. And if that completely relieves their chest pain, then you're thinking this is almost for sure ACS. Of some right. Sort. Yeah, yeah. It definitely moves the needle. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously patients with this, like we're taught that patients with esophageal spasm um, can also respond to nitro. But for me, it's if they don't respond to nitro, I don't really let that move the needle move too the much. Stuff, yeah. If they do respond to nitro, I am more concerned. Yeah. I am like definitely like more pick up the phone and can call cardiology more, right. at that point. Yeah, yeah. 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 For sure. Um, so one other thing to to mention is that women present differently totally. than men. You know, a lot of the classic symptoms that we have of chest pain are described um based off studies of white men. Totally. Where they have the sympathetic surge causing them to be diaphoretic and causing them to be nausea and vomiting. But but women present uh, a little bit differently. How, how would we find um, acute coronary syndrome differently in women than in men? Yeah. So as you already kind of alluded to, they typically will just have nonspecific like epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting. I one time had a patient. She would came in, said she ate a bad tuna sandwich. And she had a STEMI and we took her straight to the cath lab. Mm-hmm. So they can have weird presentations. And so you have to still like think about it and keep it on your differential with kind of um, people with the risk factors and also just in general. I remember that because she vomited up that tuna sandwich <laughs> and it was bad. She was right. Yeah. Turns out they she had two different both. things going on at the same time. <laughs> it's not often two things, uh, but she had two things. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and what are you looking for on on physical exam? So you kind of meant diaphoresis, tachycardia. I mean, they'll look uncomfortable. Um, sometimes though, they might not have anything at all. They might just clinically look uncomfortable, but um, also they could have like symptoms of heart failure and they could look volume overloaded. Um, it's kind of a nonspecific exam, I feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think your history leads you much more. Obviously, if the patient is sweating, you should be sweating. Um, <laughs> you know, di- like patients that have true diaphoresis, I'm at their bedside. Totally. No matter what they came in with, no matter what they're, if they are diaphoretic and it's not from, I just ran up two flights of stairs, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going in there and assessing the patient, you know, I think no matter what their symptoms are, um, because I'm worried yes, about that patient. Totally. Uh, so we, we, we order this ECG again, a lot of us, and especially the pharmacy crowd that we have, and even some of the junior physicians, again, one of the things that we want to go through, like, what are we actually looking for? I, I've heard many different variations of STEMI or ARMI or all these different these different terms has been coming out over the last few years. What is the one thing that you're looking at? Uh, and I like to think of it as if you were to teach a pharmacist to look for these things and have a PharmD positive diagnosis, what are the things that you're looking for? So we talk about, you know, we talked about STEMI a couple of times. So ST elevation, MI, um, that's when they will have like their ST segments are elevated in two or more conse- consecutive leads and then they'll have reciprocal depressions in opposite leads. So if it's a anterior MI, then inferior leads will have depressions. Um, that's like the classic STEMI, but then there's also more subtle changes that they can have. So, um, things like T wave inversions or a new left bundle. And then we talk about, you'll talk about Scarbosa criteria. Um, a, a big thing that 
I personally like to do is just anytime I get an EKG that looks at all kind of weird, maybe they have some T wave inversions. I just pull up their old one and compare it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if there's anything different, even though it's not something that we're going to like be calling the cath lab emergently, then we know to be a little bit more concerned. Perfect. So now that we got this EKG, we have our physical exam, we have our history. So those are like the, the core of emergency medicine in general. We get all of that information and then we're starting to order some labs. And I think most of us, this is where we start to differentiate again the old classification of STEMI, unstable angina, and NSTEMI based off of our EKG and then the, the biomarkers that we can get. There's a ton of different variations, and I wish I had Andrew Matuskowitz here to talk about all the different types of you know uh, troponins that we can have. But we, we, we have that. What are all the things you're going to order for these patients and why? First off, thank you for calling them biomarkers and not cardiac enzymes, uh, because most of the ones that we order, uh, including troponin, are not actually uh, enzymes. They're um, just like skeletal muscle or uh, cardiac muscle proteins, right? Um, so, uh, one of the things that I do now, so I've, I completed a fellowship in point of care, uh, emergency ultrasound, um, as a disclaimer, but, um, every chest pain patient that comes in re- regardless of their history, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a point of care echo okay. because it takes me two minutes t- to do. Um, and it gives me so much useful information. Definitely. Whenever I have a high suspicion for acute coronary syndrome, um, I'm, that as soon as the 12 lead ECG is done, as the nurses are getting access, I'm right at the bedside doing a bedside echo, um, looking for wall motion abnormality, which is fine. What I'm what I'm really looking for is it are are there big signs of a an aortic dissection yeah. or an alternative diagnosis? You know, is this pericardial tamponade, you know, from a big pericarditis that's causing, you know, the patient to be diaphoretic and has this impending sense of doom? You know, are there signs of of uh, acute uh, RV uh, systolic pressure uh, elevated, like from a from a PE, for example? Um, but I think you know the classic finding would be wall motion abnormality in the distribution of the uh, of the vessel of interest. Um, so that's the first thing that I'm doing. Other tests that I'm ordering after I get done with my echo um, include just you know. Uh, a CBC, a CMP, uh, troponin. I don't have much use for myoglobin or CKMB. Um, those are obviously uh, used in more uh, resource limited settings and obviously on tests and stuff. Um, but there's obviously they're just not specific enough. You know, the sensitivity uh, is fine, but the specificity is is, is pretty poor. Um, so along with those, I'm also ordering a chest X-ray just because I usually, you know, I think it's customary at this point more than more than anything. Um, I think screening for a widened mediastinum is is fine to do with the chest X-ray, but you know your history and physical exam can can lead you to that you know, to to that path. And I don't think it's it's a hundred percent necessary, but I'm I'm certainly doing it on every chest pain patient that is that I'm otherwise concerned about. So you mentioned the Scarbosa criteria. Can you just summarize those? Honestly, I have to look it up every time. But uh, the kind of cheat code that we learned from one of our EKG, um, like specialist, Dr. Matuskowitz. Oh, the guru. Yeah. <laughs> the guru, yes. So um, normally there's discordance with their QRS and then their T-wave. Um, and that's normal. But if you're seeing that they're going in the same direction, then you're a little bit more concerned. Um, and then, yeah. You're right. And when you say when you say discordance, you mean the ST segment is yes. lower than, than the, the baseline, yes. right? Okay, got it. Okay, so you have um, excessive, uh, discordance. Okay. And then what are some other findings in, of, on your ECG for patients that have a left bundle branch? So you kind of said concordant as well as discordant, right? Okay, right. And then an ST dep- depression in V1 through V3, um, that's greater than one millimeter, greater than or equal to one millimeter. Got it. So if the QRS is up going and the ST elevation is greater than one millimeter mm-hmm. going in the same direction mm-hmm. as the QRS, that's really concerning. And that's one where you're like, hey, that's a P wave. There's your QRS. There's your T. It looks like there's some there's ST elevation. elevation or ST depression if it's going down. So I think our minds can, can at least absorb that little point of, hey, Yes. This kind of looks like what a STEMI would look like, right? You know, totally. um, and then when you have that um, that discordant ST elevation, so when your when your QRS is going is is down going in your precordial leads, and then you have greater than five millimeters, or I think the modified Scarbosa criteria um, included is if it was greater than twenty five percent of your QRS complex, um, that that's concerning. All right, moving on. Um, Alex, let's talk about uh, 
the sort of pharmacological management of acute coronary syndrome and and what drugs we can use to help these patients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so once a diagnosis of ACS is made, um, the next step is, like you said, designing um, and initiating a pharmacotherapy regimen. If ACS is high on the differential, potentially getting, giving a loading dose of aspirin mm -hmm. is something we can do early on. Um, we know uh, regardless of STEMI and STEMI, um, unstable angina, hey, uh, loading dose of aspirin, 325 um, is appropriate. So getting that on board right away. Right. And that's not a really high dose, you know? Sure. I mean, when when we have patients that are taking, you know, anti-inflammatory dosing from like BC powder, Goody powder, you know, uh, those are, sorry, some of your proprietary names, you know, those are much bigger doses, sure, sure. you know? So um, I personally, when I see my uh, patients that I'm at least somewhat consider or considering in the differential diagnosis, the acute coronary syndrome, I give them aspirin right off the bat, sure. unless I have a really high pretest probability for an aortic dissection, a PE, um, an esophageal rupture, mm -hmm. you know, pneumothorax, one of the other things that like, I'm like, what are we doing? Right. Why would I give aspirin for this? Right. right. Unless I have a really good reason not to give it. Right. I'm giving it on every single chest pain patient just because and it's chewable aspirin, right? right so not right. the obviously not the enteric code. I want them to chew it up exactly. or rectal aspirin if they can't take it exactly. you know, by mouth. Exactly. You know, I uh, want it in their system as, as soon as possible to stabilize that. A true aspirin allergy, anaphylaxis is really the only time um, you know, I'm gonna hold aspirin. I, I assume right. you agree. What are you doing? Um, what, what what do you like to do um instead of aspirin for an antiplatelet agent if uh if sure. it's not available? Sure. You know, I think clopidogrel is the first thing we're gonna reach to if the patient has a documented, you know, true allergy. Um clopidogrel is a uh, pro drug. Um we know it inhibits the P2Y12 inhibitor on the um, ADP right. um portion of the platelet, of the surface of the platelet. And so um this is something thing that is going to actually um, also inhibit the platelet for the its lifespan, okay? We know aspirin inhibits uh, platelets for the their lifespan, 7 to 10 days. Clopidogrel also binds um, um, competitively and irreversibly uh, for that 7-day inhibition. I think our institution uses uh, ticagrelor. I think any of yeah. the P2Y12 inhibitors, yeah. you know, outside of uh, ticlopidine, which is probably at this point just a test question you know, sure, sure. for, <laughs> for sure. and, what not to do. <laughs> sure. And you bring up Ticagrelor. I'm glad you do. The brand name for that is Berlinta. And, um, you know, that's a, a, a good antiplatelet agent. Um, you know, that's going to be used kind of in the place of cl um, clopidogrel. Um, a few things to know about each agent. Um, clopidogrel specifically is going to be less effective. Um, uh, patients are going to experience about 50% um, less platelet aggregation inhibition if they take omeprazole at home. So that's a very significant drug-drug interaction. If we get a quick med rec for a patient presenting and they're taking omeprazole daily, I'm definitely going to reach for the ticagrelor. Mm, I'm not going to okay. be giving them nice. omeprazole. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be giving them uh, a clopidogrel. Okay. Um, also, patients who have a, var uh, a variant in their SIP um, 2C19 right, enzyme. COP, okay. Yeah. Um, that's the enzyme that cleaves clopidogrel to the active thiol metabolite. And so if for some reason we pull up their chart and we have a documented history of that uh, uh, variation, you know, I'm, I'm also not going to reach for the clopidogrel and I'm going to go to the ticagrelor. Okay. Sure. Um, a few things to consider um, with clopidogrel, there's a few um, dosages for loads, right? Are we given 600 or 300? Let me ask you, what, what's your uh, Clavix loading dose? Um, I think we, so previously we did 300. I know we're doing 180 of Berlinta of yep. Ticagrelor yep. right now. Um, but previously we were loading with, uh, with 300. 300. Yeah. I, I think that's, you know, I think that's a very smart dose. I think that, um, the data is a little conflicting based on, uh, what dose, uh, promotes the most bleeding. Right. Sure. Um, and we also have to consider the patient's kind of dispo, right. Are they going to get fibrinolytics are they going to the cath lab right you know also patient uh, specific factors are they at an increased risk for bleed are they greater than 75 years old these are things that are going to make me think um definitely not going to give the the 600 load and to kind of stick with the 300 to right. your point but there are you know some institutions and, and it is um listed in the guidelines the a aha uh, acc guidelines that a 600 uh uh milligram dose of clopidogrel technically is not wrong. Uh, but again, we have to consider our patient's risk for bleed. Um, as far as ticagrelor, like you said, 180 milligrams uh, one time in combination with our aspirin and our um, IV um, antithrobin agents, which we will talk about. Um, but the thing about ticagrelor different than uh, clopidogrel is the maintenance dosing is now twice a day. Okay. So um, 
it always has been, but they're going to get 180 um, of Ticagrelor in the ED, and then that's going to be followed up by 90 milligrams twice daily. Um, Sorry, can you explain what is what is maintenance dosing? I'm in the emergency department. Sure. I only ever load. <laughs> I only ever load and just get them out. Yeah, exactly, and that's and that's <laughs> kind of the great thing about kind of you know. Um, our setting. That's I know. the best thing. Exactly. I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and as the pharmacist, I think it's, you know, it's important that we do have to kind of keep in mind, are we starting a regimen that is inappropriate to continue from? Sure. So I agree. That, is someone else just going to change this immediately? Right. 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 You want to start them off on the right path. <laughs> exactly. And there, are, there have been some studies specifically regarding anticoagulation, the synergy trial that tell us if we switch up, if we switch agents halfway, for instance, if we start anoxaparin and then we switch them to heparin, they have more risks for reocclusion, more risks for um, basically poor outcomes. Sure. Um, and so that's why even if it's even if it's after the 24 hours that the uh, low molecular weight heparin. Uh, yeah, has yeah, gone, really? yeah. Yeah. Really? Um, yeah. We'll pull, we'll pull up the, the, the wow. results of the synergy. So uh, it's not like trials. you're you're you give them a shot of Lovenox and then six hours later you decide to put them on heparin. Right. Because right? obviously they would already be anticoagulated on for another six hours. Weight. Right. Yeah. Right. Because right. if you give one dose, that's the thing. That's the great thing about lower molecular weight heparin, anoxaparin, Lovenox, is that um, technically it's thought to you attain therapeutic anticoagulation sooner than with heparin, right? With heparin, we need to... I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Technically, you know, and of course, we're still going to check for um, an anti-10A level with an oxparin after the fourth or fifth dose if we're kind of doing our due diligence. But as far as heparin's concerned, they may not be... That's why we give a bolus. They may not be therapeutic. Everybody, the, the bioavailability of heparin is erratic in, from patient to patient. So really, just because we start heparin doesn't necessarily mean they're therapeutic. We may give them a bolus, start the drip for four hours, check their APTT. It could be a 40, right? And for um, ACS, we always target an APTT of 61 to 105, okay? So really, um, that's one thing about heparin is we are not positive that they are therapeutically anticoagulated regardless of the bolus dose or the higher um, you know, drip rate that we start. Oh, that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm just yeah, gonna get rid yeah. of that information. Yeah, right which now. is why it's important <laughs> we get antiplatelet on board. And like I said in the beginning, it's important we have a strong monitoring program because a monitoring plan. Because yeah, if we start heparin, yeah. it's it, it, they may be in the ED for four hours. I'm sure that's happened. Wow, that'd be, be their shortest ER stay. Exactly, I think, exactly. All day. <laughs> so if we're not, you know, if we're not They're in the doing, waiting room for four hours. <laughs> right, right. So if we're not doing our due diligence and looking at that first anti 10A or that first APTT level, mm -hmm. then hey, we may realize like this guy has a, he's got a full, he's got, or maybe he's got an end stemmy, but Hey, his APTT is for some reason, his anti 10A isn't even 0.1. That's not therapeutic. That's our heparin's not doing the job. That's when we may want to um, think about switching to another agent, whether it's an oxaparin or bivalve. Man, thank God for pharmacists. Cause I just turned my brain off. <laughs> yeah. I put those orders in. I just do whatever the nurses tell me. Talk to cardiology once the dispo is done. Yeah. Uh, one other aside about our antiplatelet agents, just for the yeah. nerds of the audience. Uh, sort of lower yield, but I mentioned ticlopidine earlier. Um, that's an old P2Y12 inhibitor um, that really isn't used uh, as much anymore. Uh, and the two, I think, moderately higher yield um, uh, adverse effects to remember from those are um, ticlopidine can give you uh, neutropenia and I think it can give you TTP mm -hmm. as well, the yeah. thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura. So for that reason, um, we're, we switched more to doing, you know, clopidogrel, Razagrel, Ticagrelor, uh, one of the other uh, to to make us uh, dual the dual antiplatelet. Yeah, absolutely. I think the big one is the um, is the bone marrow suppression um, that you mentioned, and you also mentioned uh, prasugrel. And I think it's also important to note that um, there are certain patients where we want to avoid. Okay, and those are patients who have a history of a TIA or history of stroke. Um, I would extend this, okay, based on uh, my understanding of the of the literature, to anybody who's at an increased risk for bleeding, mm -hmm. I'd go away from Prasugrel. Okay? Sure. Um, just because um, the studies are showing us that these patients do um, end up having more serious bleeds, okay? Sure. Um, intracranial bleeds, um, uh, uh, including. So um, definitely a concern to kind of keep at the forefront of your uh, brain when you're kind of going to um, you know, put orders in. Right. Sure. To the pharmacist listening, if you're in the ED and you have one of these patients come in, don't think just because they're coming from EMS, they got aspirin. 
because that might not be on the differential until they get to the ED and they see our position, right? And so confirm, make sure you get with the uh, EMS, you know, as we always do and and ask them what, what drugs were given um, and, you know, confirm that aspirin um, was in fact given. Um, the best way to tell is just to pull their cheek inside and look yeah. on, look for the chalky white. Yeah, just exactly. Just um, <laughs> so we actually had an interesting, I had an interesting order come across, uh, uh, my computer last weekend I was working and um, I was actually working with my co-resident Deja Davis and we got an order for uh clopidogrel 525 milligrams. Wow. And um, uh, Deja called me and said, have you ever seen 525 milligrams? <laughs> and I had to, you know, kind of sit there and wrap my head around it. And um, what had happened was, is the patient was on clopidogrel at home has, has stents in the recent past and came in with an ACS event had already taken his clopidogrel this morning. Sure. So then they wanted to give him the full 600. Right. So they ordered 525. Interesting. So yeah, th again, there's going to be a lot of ways, depending on your, your patient case, depending on um, the, the, the care that they need, their bleed risk, um, and the, obviously the severity of the disease that the dose could change. So um, I think it's good to under have a good understanding about what the guidelines recommend, what the data is telling us, but it is more important to look at your patient. Right. Usually when you see a number like that, it's, it's it's wrong, right, <laughs> you know. Right, I mean, right, like right. I'm like, oh, what did you take for your back pain? Oh, I took 500 milligrams of ibuprofen. Oh, really? Yeah. Extra strength. You better believe it, doc. That's good. Now, oh, see them in a minute. Set them all. That's good. Okay. Up. Unless you got a prescription for you know 500 milligram tablet of yeah. ibuprofen, which I actually have seen that before. I've seen we like weird does of like actual prescriptions oh, interesting. Of, interesting. of ibuprofen of like you know someone like, given 500 for of yeah uh, ibuprofen. yeah i don't even know how you do that yeah you do that. i don't take know. the 200s i can't even you know, i can't even weird uh, it's interesting well you know it's you know we've come a long way from uh mona bash which was uh like the mnemonic device that i learned when i was sure. a medical student uh for um for treatment of acute coronary syndrome um and that included i think morphine mm -hmm. which we're not giving routinely anymore. Correct. In fact, there's some evidence to say that it might be doing harm. Correct. Um, oxygen supplementation. Obviously, we're only doing that now if they're hypoxemic, um, in which case I'm also considering other di diagnoses on my differential, mm. you know, outside of acute coronary syndrome. I think it's probably my, the, the biggest part of that. Um, but like I said, you know, we've we've come a long way uh, from Mona Bash from giving uh, patients uh, you know, beta blockers like carvedilol mm -hmm. empirically in the emergency department mm -hmm. that used to be like a, a core measure from, uh, from, you know, our like safety, uh, guidelines to do. Um, I am, uh, currently doing, uh, statins acutely yeah, for plaque yeah. stabilization, just because there's probably in my, in my understanding, based on my reading, probably not a whole lot of harm that can be done with it, yeah, agree, you know, agree. and if there's any benefit that can be gained, you know, right now, it, it looks like the evidence is, is, is modest, but if there's any, you know, benefit that can be gained with minimal, you know, risk, then that's, you know, I'm pulling the trigger on absolutely. it. You know yeah, I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I guess uh, the next kind of class of agents to talk about are our anti-thrombins, our anti-coagulants. So really all the patients who, um, you know, have ACS, whether it's definitive or likely, um, we're going to want to start, uh, parenteral anticoagulation. And so um, our workhorse uh, a lot of times in the ED is heparin. Um, <clears throat> heparin pr really prevents formation of the clots uh, in the blood by by potentiating the action of antithrombin-3, uh, thereby inactivating uh, thrombin and preventing the conversion uh, of fibrin from fibrinogen. Um, uh, the, like, like I mentioned earlier, the dose um, of heparin um, is pretty much standard. However, the bioavailability from patient to patient um, can be variable, uh, making the anticoagulation response somewhat unpredictable. Um, you'll see some patients in the um, hospital on therapeutic heparin at a rate of eight units per kg um, per, per hour or as high as 30, right? And so um, also, Another point, it's very important. Once we get this started, we got to circle back. Um, what's our monitoring plan? What's the initial APTT, anti-10A? Does that heparin rate need to be um, increased You know, after the first six hours? Um, a lot of times the initial dose for ACS is going to be an, an initial bolus of 60 units per keg uh, with a max dose of uh, 4,000 units, followed up by an infusion um, starting at 12 units per keg per hour um, with a max of 1,000 units an hour. Um, again, a patient's um, risk for bleeding uh, 
uh, may cause you to, for some reason, decrease that initial rate. Um, uh, so just something to kind of consider. You always got to think about patient specific factors. Um, adverse effects with heparin um, include, of course, increase, increasing uh, our bleeding risk for bleeding. I knew exactly. it. I knew exactly. it. Yeah. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> the one other big thing to kind of keep in mind is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. I'm sure, um, you know, all of us have, have uh, kind of come across this within our practice, um, which is why a lot of providers uh, potentially may, um, you know, elect to get the heparin off after 48 hours to kind of um, uh, uh, cut back on the formation of these um, antibodies that um, really attack the platelets. Um, I'm sorry, anoxaparin or lower molecular weight heparin um, is the second uh, uh, parenteral anticoagulation that we could use. Um, it does have a greater bioavailability, lower protein binding, um, and again, a significantly longer half-life. Um, really, it's just a more reliable anticoagulant. Um, but again, you have to consider the setting. With such a long half-life, once you give a dose, you know, once I give a sub-Q dose of one mg per kg, this patient is now anticoagulated for 12 hours. Um, we know that patients that are going to go get cabbage, um, for instance, they, we don't want them anticoagulated for that long. Right. right. So, um, kind of considering, um, again, the patient's dispo, uh, what's going to happen, um, after this, uh, you know, initial couple hours, um, uh, is important. I call it fractionated heparin just to scare and confuse the rest of the team. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if, <laughs> cause if your doctor is, is, uh, laying over your bed and saying, we're going to start fractionated <laughs> Fractionated heparin, yeah, that's that's the concern. Yeah. All right, uh, okay. Put me some fracture parent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fracture parent. I like the fracture parent. All right, guys. All right, so uh, talk about when we should give this weird one-time dose of IV anoxaparin. Yeah, yeah. Um, you that's know, what? a new one for me. I never heard of this. Yeah, IV IV lovenox. Um, so you Feels know, like an accident. <laughs> yeah. The American um, Heart Association and the ACC, um, they kind of highlight the um, this specific dosing recommendation. OK, so it's really important to keep in mind. This is a dose for patients that are going to be going for PCI. So they're headed to the cath lab. And the information we have to gather is when was their last Lovenox dose? If their last Lovenox dose was within eight hours, then no reason for IV Lovenox, we can send them straight to the PCI. Okay, if their last um, Lovenox dose was between eight and 12 hours, then we're going to give them 0.3 milligrams per kilogram IV and then send them to the cath lab. Okay, and really that's that dose is um, thought to kind of push them into the therapeutic window, um, give them a little extra anticoagulation um, to prevent reocclusion post cath lab. My nurse is going to say absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. But again, it's something. All right, That's so we cool. talked about aspirin. We talked about some anticoagulants. Really, heparin is our workhorse. It seems to be. We give the three twenty five of aspirin. We give our our heparin bolus. Again, some people make up make a fight for four thousand as the max versus five thousand. What's the max? I'm mm. not necessarily on that. But if you're studying for board certification, guys, four thousand is the technical yeah answer that they want you to see for acute coronary for acute coronary. Surgery. For PE, it's five thousand. Oh no, it's for for PE. We're talking about I think ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. That's wow. Larger. Which is which is strange again. So depending on where you're at, certain like certain hospitals uh, protocols will have five thousand for for a STEMI or four thousand with the guy. Right. Based off of some kind of weak data um, that has nothing to do necessarily with um, actual patient specific outcomes, but again, that's something that's listed that a lot of conversation happens between cardiology because okay. they remember the textbook. They tell us the textbook. It's like, yeah. Why? I yeah. need to change the flashcard that I made when I yeah. was a medical student. The so, dosing for that. <laughs> so again, we just know that. So again, six, so it seems to be 60 units per kilo with a max of anywhere from 4 to 5,000 depending mm -hmm. on what you want. And then usually a rate to start up at 12. This is going to usually be in your order sets. Mm -hmm. so that's fine. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the Noxaparin wrap up. Again, one meter per kg is the beautiful dose that we can do. Uh, give it one time. But again, it's going to last quite a while, anywhere from 8 to 12 hours. If it, if you're in that 8 to 12 hour range, again, the got to send and get that one time. One three meter per kg. IV dose. Mm -hmm. Then you can convince everyone in the ER to do yeah. if that happens. Yeah. Uh, let's move forward to something that is one of the, the cores of yeah. uh, ACS and nitrates. Again, we nitrates have a long history and everyone that have you gave nitro yet? Yeah. So nitroglycin, tell us about some of like the back and like, how does it work? Um, you know, this is a drug we use often in the ED. Really important we know how it's really important we know how it works. Um <clears throat> really um I have a know, headache. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Vasodilation. So nitro relaxes the smooth muscle walls 
uh, of the blood vessels, increasing blood flow through metabolic conversion of the nitrate directly to nitric oxide. And so we know that when we have vaso, uh, to Quinn's point, uh, when we have vasodilation in the kind of the cranial uh, uh, blood vessels, that's when we get kind of the throbbing headache. And so um, definitely when we're starting patients on a nitro infusion, um, you will hear them say, um, one of the first things is, oh man, I have a headache. And that means the nitro is working. Um, <clears throat> you know, what's the rationale for using these nitrates? Um, well, one, they uh, are very good at relieving uh, chest pain. Why? Because they're vasodilating and making our coronary arteries larger, so more blood can pass through. Therefore, hopefully, um, uh, helping us with this oxygen and uh, supply and demand mismatch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, furthermore, uh, when we use nitro with acute MI patients uh, not treated with uh, thrombolytics, um, it helps reduce the infarct size. Okay, so not only are we re uh, relieving chest pain, but we're hopefully trying to save some of this heart tissue. Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, the dosing, um, you know, there's sublingual dosing and there's IV dosing. Okay, patients who are having um, an NSTEMI or potentially unstable angina, uh, you know. Usually the recommendation is to start with the sublingual, okay? So 0.4 uh, milligrams sublingually every five minutes for up to three doses, okay? Once that's not working anymore, that's when it's time to go to the IV, um, kind of the IV uh, dosing. But again, <laughs> this is also kind of to the earlier point is not only is it important to design a nice, you know, a good pharmacotherapy regimen, but you got to have the monitoring, right? You got to come back around. Otherwise, you'll come back in an hour and they're Nitro will still be running at 10 and you have gotten nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to kind of be diligent in the ED. I think it's a, a really good opportunity for the PharmD to be active, um, you know, make really high yield interventions uh, for our patients and our physicians. Now, one quick point about the, you know, nitroglycerin. And so uh, actually, before I do this, are you guys only doing the sublingual tablets? Are you doing the sprays, any of the topical yeah. stuff? Yeah, again, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, there's a, there's a place for the paste and the trash sprays. cans. <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't found them in my practice. Sure. Yeah. All right. I, I may not be smart enough right. to use the paste in the, the ointments, things that nature. I, I just have never had it. Again, I'm in a large academic medical center with tons of resources as well. I'm not shipping uh -huh. anywhere else. Right. So, sure. But I'm not considering that. And I want to monitor my patients pretty quickly. Well, so, to be fair, there may be other disease processes outside of acute yeah. coronary syndrome that you would want a topical, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, vaso, you know, yeah. agent. I think a big one is extravasation. Okay. So if, right. if we have extravasation um, and we don't have access to, right, right, phentolamine, then nitroglycerin would be a mm -hmm. good, good thing to, to use. Yeah. It just have not benefited me as much. It didn't work as quick. And for me, it's like, Real patients with ACS, I'm not, I don't expect to spend hours with them. I expect to get their pain under control, and depending on what's going on, be able to make a decision based yeah. off their pain being either controlled or not controlled. So sublingual is what I commonly Correct. use, and then once that doesn't work, I will treat the IV. Yep. Because again, I think we forget that most of the data uh, with nitroglycerin has been you know, we're talking eighties here, but mm -hmm. most of the data is with IV, mm -hmm. right? Uh, pre PCI. So right. I want to make sure I right. caveat that as well. Right. And we still got a. Um, I don't think we've mentioned. The big concern here is hypotension. So it's still important we're watching our patients. You know, it, they may have risk factors for being hypotensive. We also got to look at the med list. Again, important for the pharmacist. Take a look. Are they on sildenafil at home? Do they have pulmonary artery hypertension? If that's the case, I wouldn't even start. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Right. I would. I would not start the nitro. Right. There are also a couple other instances not to use uh, nitroglycerin. Yeah. Um, one of the big ones is like symptomatic aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. um, basically. Um, you just call like your your pressure just drops because they're pretty preload dependent. Um, mm -hmm. Same with RVMI. Um, yeah. So right ventricular MI is another yeah, reason uh, not to give that. So for that reason, you that, that's like one of the main reasons why I do my bedside echo beforehand. Mm -hmm. Not only to look for alternative diagnosis and wall motion abnormality, but like take a look at their RV, yeah. take a look at the aorta, throw a color Doppler across, make sure, you know, that if I'm going to give nitro, which usually is lower down on my, you know, mm -hmm. of like, Hey, emergently we right. need aspirin. Hey, right. we need to stabilize this clot as soon as possible right. and treat their symptomatology, you know, with nitro totally. obviously is good. Um, it's a little bit different too. Um, uh, sometimes we'll have patients that have Prince metals angina, which is a different, uh, variant where there's no acute, uh, thrombotic occlusion. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just phasospasm of sure. the coronary arteries. And so those are the patients that often respond like really briskly to nitro. Mm -hmm. And 
once the nitro wears off, they'll go back to that yeah. spasm, and then we'll start to realize, hey, there's a temporal relationship between their symptomatology and their nitroglycerin, you know, dose inside of their body. Um, How often can, do you see that coming in? I've seen it maybe two or three oh, times, yeah. you know, in my like seven or eight year sure. career as a physician. Our, our, our big gun. No, I think just um, if you can get a chewable aspirin in, the earlier, yeah. the better. And unless you really, really think there's a completely different, if they have a knife sticking out of their chest and they're complaining of chest pain, it's probably from the knife, you know, you know, I'm probably not giving aspirin to those patients and everyone else gets four milligrams, four uh, tablets to chew it up as soon as yeah. possible. If not by EMS, then they're getting it as soon as possible from me. And that's the harm from that is minimal. And, and that's four to 81s. Right. That's four to 81s. Yeah. They can't take PO. I've actually had a few. That's suppository. And if you're in this weird space where you can take all that, but you're allergic, just give them a bit of room. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I just kind of the biggest thing from there. Any closing thoughts on like uh, anticoagulation things that they are? Uh, um, no, I think we covered it. I think that you know, as far as long as we're kind of choosing an agent that. Um, uh, and, we were choosing an agent after we've considered patient specific factors and we're making sure to kind of circle back and check, check in after we've started these, these regimens. I think that, um, you know, I think we've covered all the main points. The final thought that I have about anticoagulation is that um, let's, we need to keep a close eye on heparin. Um, there's been some evidence, including a Cochrane review from 2008 um, that showed uh, that there was basically only harm uh, in giving it. And, uh, nobody was helped in terms of mortality or preventing a non-fatal MI. Um, one in 25 were harmed with a major bleeding event and one in 17 were harmed with a minor bleeding event. Um, so there, it, um, even though it makes sense from a physiologic standpoint, there is some evidence that, to say that it actually does more harm than good. Sure. Um, so just to keep a close eye sure. on that. You also got to consider seven, one in 17 harmed by a minor bleed or a major bleed. Of course, you know, major bleeds, you know, we try to avoid yeah, those. Want to avoid that. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, a uh, clot in your heart versus a minor bleed, you know, what exactly, right. you know, sure. risk benefit. But again, um, definitely have to watch out. Yeah. Thank you guys for, for listening. Uh, but we want to make sure that you guys know of these two big things that we're releasing this year. It's going to be probably the biggest thing that we have. Again, a way for you to get board certified with a pack you prep that we just made. And then, Probably the biggest conference that we're going to, that's going to be this year for emergency medicine pharmacists. Um, and I, I say that because we're going to have so much programming for you guys. And we're also going to be able to provide a phenomenal relationship with the SAEM crew. There's going to be a ton of information that's going to provide us value as well. And I think realistically, we fought very hard to make sure that um, from a pricing standpoint, it wasn't at the, the highest tier that could have been provided. Um, so we're excited about that. We're excited about the relationship that we're building. So again, thank you guys again for listening to this episode. As always, guys, close it out the same way every time. Uh, you don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't have to work in an ED. But everything you do, make sure you farm so hard. Closes it. Ozzy scratches his head. Whatever she's looking for, it isn't in there.